We present Peter Cook and Marjorie Westbury in Paul Temple and the Margot Mystery. Episode 5, Breakwater House. You rang, sir? Yes, Wilson. Here's Mr. Temple's cheque. He wants £50 in fives. See if you can find some new notes. Very good, Mr. Northampton. Well, I hope we shall have the pleasure of seeing you again in Tenterhurst, Mr. Temple. I hope so, too, Mr. Northampton. Yes? Edgar Northampton. Oh, that's right, Mr. Temple. But how I heard you... your name mentioned when I was getting some petrol at the garage in Westerton. Oh, yes, yes. We have a sub-branch there, Tuesdays and Fridays. Oh, then I expect you know Mrs. Fletcher and her son. They keep the garage in the high street. Fletcher? Now, let me think now. Oh, yes, I remember. We met at a garden fete about eight months ago. When she discovered I was a bank manager, she was rather anxious to get my advice. <laughs> I expect people are always after free advice. Oh, they are indeed. Still, advice costs nothing, as they say. <laughs> Fifty and five, sir. Oh, thank you, Wilson. Here's a cheque. Thank you, sir. Well, there we are, Mr Temple. I'll just count them for you. Ten fives. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I must be getting along. My wife's waiting for me in the car. Well, any time you're passing, Mr Temple, we'll be delighted to see you. Thank you. Oh, hello, Mr Temple. Oh, good afternoon, Mr Cross. I uh, had to dash over to cash a cheque for the doctor. Ten ones, five in halves, Mr. Cross. Thank you. Oh, I'd like a new chequebook, 30 of them. Yes, sir. you find that sports car of yours expensive to run, Mr. Cross? Sports car? Mm, the cream one, the one I saw you in the other night with Linda Kelburn. Who's Linda Kelburn? She's George Kelburn's wife, Julia's stepmother. You saw me with Mrs. Kelburn? Yes. Where? Leicester Square. You certainly didn't. I don't know Mrs. Kelburn. I don't know any of the Kelburns. Didn't you know Julia? No, why should I? She was a patient of Dr. Benkari's. So what? You're the doctor's secretary. Surely you know her patients. Not all of them. I see. Your checkbook, sir. Thank you. Goodbye, Temple. Goodbye. Oh, if you see me in that sports car again, stop me. I'd like to take a look at it. I'll bear that in mind, Mr. Cross. Oh, did you get the money? Yes. Well, you've been ages. Mm, I've been talking to Larry Cross. He was cashing a check. Yes, I saw him going into the bank. I had a good look at him this time, and I was right, Paul. He was the man I told you about, the man at London Airport. I'm not surprised. He's a nasty piece of work. Well, come on, Steve, Brighton. All right. Did you telephone Charlie? Yes. He's catching the four o'clock train. Room 528, Mr. Temple. Oh, thank you. I'll have your baggage sent up to your room, sir. <laughs> I'm afraid we haven't any at the moment. Oh, indeed, sir. We're having our things brought down from London. Uh, would you have them sent up to our room as soon as they arrive? Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Temple. Uh, your key. Thank you. Oh, good afternoon. Mr. George Kelburn is expecting me. Uh, your name, sir? Langdon. Uh, just a minute, sir. Hello, Langdon. Temple! Well, what do you know? Hello, Mrs. Temple. Good afternoon, Mr. Lennon. Well, this really is a pleasure. I had no idea you'd be down here. Oh, we've hoped we needed a breath of sea air. You're not the only ones. Kelvin's got the same idea. I thought you were going back to the States, Mr. Langdon. I was, Mrs. Temple. I was due to leave this morning, but Kelvin made me cancel. Why? Well, there seems to be an awful lot of work to do, and he doesn't seem able to handle it. I guess he's, well, he's gotten used to having me around. That's about it. Mm, I'm sure you've been a great help, Langdon. Yeah, I know, but... He expects me to interfere in affairs which don't really concern me. Family affairs? Yeah. Only the other day he was asking my advice about a divorce. Oh, don't tell me he'll expect you to handle that for him. <laughs> You'd be surprised what he expects me to handle, Mrs. Temple. Is he interested in some other woman, do you think? Oh, why, no. The boot's on the other foot, if anything. Oh? I've seen Linda out twice recently with another man. A tall, dark-haired, hatchet-faced man of about 40. Yeah, yeah, it could be. I think you'll find he's Dr. Benkari's secretary. Dr. Benkari? That's the doctor Julia consulted. That's right. Do you know this character Linda was with then? I've met him. Uh, when? During the course of my investigations. 
But how did Mrs. Kelburn meet him? That's what I'd like to know. Oh, well, maybe she went with Julia one day. To the doctors, I mean. Hmm. That's certainly a possible explanation. Excuse me, sir. Mr. Kelburn says you may go up now. It's room 219, second floor. Oh, thank you. Will you be staying on in London, Langdon? No, that's up to Kelburn. But I can tell you one thing. The moment he gives the word, I'll be heading straight back to New York. Well, Fiona Scott's not in the phone book. I can't say I'm surprised. I didn't expect it to be that easy. Were you surprised to see Langdon down here? Not really. Why? Because of what Bill Fletcher told me. What do you mean? Langdon tried to persuade his mother to bring a coat to Brighton to deliver it to Margot. Do you think that Margot and this girl, Fiona Scott, are one and the same person? <laughs> you asked me that question before, Steve. I don't know. According to Kelvin, Fiona Scott is a highly respectable young lady who disapproved of Julia's more sensational friends. Well, I should forget all about Fiona Scott, and I should concentrate on Mike Langdon. Hmm. And what about the other suspects? Larry Cross, Tony Wyman, Mrs. Fletcher, Dr. Benkari, Edgar Northampton. The bank manager? You don't think he had anything to do with this? Well, Mrs. Fletcher implied that he knew something about Dr. Benkari. What sort of a man was he? Edgar Northampton? No, oh, hmm. typical bank manager. Mm, hello? Temple? Yes? Uh, Forbes here. Oh, hello, Sir Graham. How did you know we were down here? Well, Charlie told me. What are you doing in Brighton, anyway? Oh, we thought we'd come down here for a breath of sea air. I see. I thought perhaps you might be looking for a girl named Fiona Scott. <laughs> how did you find out the name? Oh, what's more to the point, how did you find it? I had a talk to Tony Wyman. He apparently met her some little while ago. I see. Well, listen, Temple, we've got her phone number. Brighton 96210. Brighton 96210. Yes, but we haven't contacted her because we don't want to scare the girl. I thought you might phone her, unofficially, as it were, and get the lie of the land. Yes, all right, Sir Graham. Love to Steve. Thank you. Charlie told him we were down here. He's given me Fiona Scott's phone number. I'll bet Superintendent Rain found it. He'd make sure you weren't going to put one over on him. <laughs> Brighton 96210. Oh, uh, could I speak to Miss Fiona Scott, please? Who is it speaking? My name is Temple, Paul Temple. This, this is Fiona Scott speaking. Oh, good afternoon, Miss Scott. Look, I'm sorry to trouble you, but I understand from Mr. Kelburn that you were a friend of his daughter's. Yes. Yes, I was. Well, as you may know, I'm investigating Mr. the... Mr. Temple, please don't think me rude, but, but I don't want to have anything to do with this business. Julia's dead, and I... Look, Miss Scott, I'm not trying to get you involved in this affair. Please don't think that. Well, what are you trying to do? Well, you knew Julia. You were a very close friend of hers. I think you were probably more fond of her than anyone else. Well? Well, you might be able to tell me little things about her that... Well, that might be useful. Naturally, whatever you tell me, I should treat in the strictest confidence. I'm rather busy at the moment, and, I, and I'm going over to Seadale this afternoon. Well, wouldn't it be possible for me to meet you at Seadale? Well, I... I'm staying with friends. I could drive over tonight, or tomorrow morning, or any time you like. Well, let's say this evening, then. Splendid. Eight o'clock? Yes. I suppose that will be convenient. My friends live at Breakwater House. Breakwater House? Yes, it's about a mile outside the village, further along the coast. I see. Thank you very much, Miss Scott. I'll see you this evening, then. And um, please don't mention this conversation to anyone. No, I won't. Goodbye, Mr. Temple. Goodbye. Well, I gather we are going out tonight. Yes. What did she sound like? Oh, quiet, well-spoken. She's visiting some friends at a place called Seadale. Seadale? Mm. That's, uh, that's further along the coast. It's about uh, 15 miles from here. Yes. Come in. Hello, Mrs Temple. Oh, hello, Charlie. Oh, I say, you haven't wasted much time. No, wonderful train service. Here's your case, Mrs Temple. And here's yours, sir. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, what's the other case? Oh, well, I brought the tape recorder down, Mr. Temple. I thought I'd take the phone calls while you were away so that you could hear them for yourself. It's better than writing a message down. Much better, Charlie. Uh, plug it in over here. Right. Have there been many calls? Well, only two important ones. Sir Graham rang, but, well, he only wanted to know where you were. The first call was from a woman. She wouldn't give a name or anything. Proper bag of mystery. Mm -hmm. What time was this? Well, it was about ooh, half past ten this morning. Here it is, Steve. Can I speak to Mr. Temple? Well, I'm afraid he's away at the moment. Who is that? You wouldn't know my name. Where is Mr. Temple? Oh, he's gone down to Brighton for a few days with Mrs. Temple. 
Why has he gone to Brighton, do you know? No, I'm sorry, I don't know. Is he going to Dreamland? <laughs> don't ask me. I shouldn't think so. Not Mr Temple's cup of tea. Look, if you leave your name, I'll Where's get... Mr Temple staying? I'm sorry, I don't know. Oh. All right. I'll ring you later. Stop the recorder, Charlie. Did you recognise the voice, Paul? Yes, it was Mrs Fletcher. <laughs> Made me laugh when she mentioned Dreamland. Is that the funfair? That's right, Mrs Temple. Over on the other side of the pier. I can't imagine you, Mr Temple, on the Dodgems. Can't you, Charlie? All right, let's hear the next one. Hello? Can I speak to Mr Temple? Well, I'm afraid he's away at the moment. Oh. Oh, dear. Have you any idea when he'll be back? No, I'm afraid I haven't. Can I take a message? Will you be seeing Mr Temple? Uh, yes, this afternoon. I'm going down to... Uh, to see him. Well, this is Mrs Kelburn. I'd like you to deliver a message for me. OK. Go ahead. Mr Temple saw me in a sports car the other night. I'm very anxious that he shouldn't mention this fact to anyone, particularly my husband. Oh. Oh, I see. Well, I'll make sure he gets a message. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, that ties up with what Mike Langdon said, doesn't it? You mean another man and the possibility of Kelburn getting a divorce? Yes. Yes. But I can hardly believe Linda Kelburn's fallen for someone like Larry Cross. Well, we never can tell. Women are peculiar creatures. Yeah, you can say that again. Oh, <laughs> oh I beg your pardon, Mrs <laughs> Temple. You'd better get back to town, Charlie. Yes. Here, take, take the recorder with you. Right, sir. Mm, are you all right for money? Yes, fine, thanks. Keep taping the phone calls. You know where we are if there's anything urgent. Righty-o. Goodbye, Mrs Temple. Don't eat too much rock. <laughs> Goodbye, Charlie. <laughs> Paul, why do you think Mrs Fletcher mentioned that fairground place in Dreamland? I don't know, but she obviously thought that was one of the reasons why we came here. But why on earth should she think that? We won't know until we go and see. Oh, I can't wait for that. <laughs> Come in. Oh, forgive my troubling you, Temple, but uh, can you spare me a minute? Yes, of course. Come in, Cabin. Uh, you know my wife? Yes, yes, I do. Good afternoon, Mrs Temple. Good afternoon, Mr Cabin. Sit down. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to apologise for my rudeness the last time we met. I have rather an abrupt manner at times, and it occasionally, well, it gives the wrong impression. That's all right, Mr Kelvin. You know, you were perfectly right, of course, Temple. No reason why you shouldn't continue your investigations if you feel like it. Quite understandable to want to keep on with a case once you've started it. Incidentally, is that why you're down here in Brighton? Uh, my wife had a rather unpleasant experience. We thought a change of air might do her good. Yes. Yes, 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 of course. Well, I'll tell you what I wanted to have a word with you about, Temple. It's, uh, it's rather a delicate matter. Yes. You'll treat this in confidence, of course. Certainly. I'm afraid I'm having trouble with my wife. What kind of trouble? Mm, she stays out late. She doesn't tell me where she's been and... Well, to be perfectly honest, I think she's having an affair with someone. Have you spoken to her about it, Mr. Galvin? Yes, but she refuses to admit it. But she is, I'm sure she is. Well, what do you want me to do about it? I'd like you to make some inquiries for me. Watch her, if possible. Well, it's hard. Well, I him. know it isn't your usual line of country. <laughs> it certainly isn't. But you see, if I employed one of the ordinary agencies, Linda would be onto it straight away. I'm sure she would. And you don't think she'd suspect me? No, I'm positive she wouldn't. She might even confide in you. No, I don't think... I'm convinced that you're the man for this assignment, Temple. Does Mike Langdon agree with you? Yes, he does. Well, I'll think about it. All right, but don't be too long about it, eh? <laughs> it's important. I won't mention a fee because the last time I mentioned... I'll money... let you have a decision this evening. You'll be in the hotel, I take it? Yes, I will. I'm dining here. All right. Uh, thank you, Temple. Mr. Kelvin, who do you think your wife is uh, friendly with? I don't know. Don't you suspect anyone? No. She's got a large circle of friends, but according to Langdon, she's been seeing rather a lot of uh, Tony Wyman just lately. But whether he's the man or not, I wouldn't know. Well, I uh, look forward to hearing from you, Temple. I'll see you tonight. Goodbye, Mrs. Temple. Goodbye. Paul, do you know what I think? No. What do you think? For some reason or other... Kelvin wants you to drop this case. And if you won't, then he'll try and divert your attention onto something else. Meaning his wife? Yes. Mm hmm. Could be. Well, come on, Steve. 
Where are we going? Do you feel like a nice smooth ride on a roller coaster? No, dear. <laughs> I don't feel like a nice smooth ride on anything. <laughs> Oh, my feet are sending up an SOS. <laughs> it shan't be long, oh. Steve. But I don't want to leave here without exploring... By Timothy. Look at that sign. Where? On the tent near the shooting gallery. Madam Margot, mm. fortune teller. Oh, so that's what Mrs Fletcher meant. Yes. She thought that you'd found out about Madam Margot and that was the reason you'd come to Brighton. I think you're right, Steve. Now listen... I want you to go in and have your fortune told. But first, I'll tell you what I want you to do. Oh, <clears throat> oh, I'm so sorry, madam. Do come in. I was just having a cup of tea. I can wait. No, no. Please sit down, madam. Right. Um, you are Madam Margot. That's right, dear. They all know me in Brighton. I've been here for years. Now, what sort of a reading did you want? Well, I don't know. Which would you recommend? Well, looking at you, I'd say the palm, madam. Of course, it's a bit more expensive, but it goes deeper. Much deeper, if you know what I mean. Yes, you read the palm of a friend of mine, and, and you told her the most amazing story. It mm. all came true. That's what made me so curious. Did I? I wonder if I remember her. Oh, I'm sure you would. You foretold a great tragedy in her life, and it happened. Just as you said. Really? Oh, well, of course, there's no getting away from the palm. It's all there. <laughs> what happened to your friend? She was murdered. Murdered? Yes. Her name was Julia Kelburn. Oh, yes, I think I read about the murder. But you don't remember, Julia? No, I'm afraid not. But, of course, I see so many people, you know, especially in the height of the season. Yes, I suppose you do. No, dear, if you'll just sit facing me... Like this? Yes, that's right. Which hand do you want? Oh, both, dear. Under the light, if you don't mind. That's it. Ah, oh, that's very interesting. Were you ever on the stage? No, I wasn't. You're married, and your husband's well-known. Famous, in fact. Got something to do with books and writing. Is that right, dear? Yes. Hmm, it's an interesting hand. You travel a lot, don't you, uh, Mrs...? Yes, we travel quite a lot. I can see a journey now, towards the end of the year, a sea voyage. Oh, and there's danger too, dear. You've got to be very careful, both you and your husband. Why? Because I can see an accident, a car accident. When is this accident likely to happen? It may be soon. Very soon. Where is it going to happen? I don't know, but... Go on. Well, it seems to me your husband's driving. There's something here in your palm. I can't quite tell what it is. It looks like a dolphin. A dolphin? You mean a real dolphin? Well, I can't tell. But watch out for it. When you see the dolphin, be on your guard, dear. That's when the accident might happen. When I mentioned Julia Kelvin, she seemed to be on her guard. I think she had a good idea then who I was. Mm, it sounds like it. The whole setup was terribly phony. Normally, I wouldn't believe a word she said, but that was a warning call about the car accident. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Do you think she was expecting you? Well, it's difficult to say. But the thing that puzzled me is, what did she mean, watch out for the dolphin? I don't know. It could be a public house, I suppose, at a dangerous corner or crossroads. Oh, yes. I, I never thought of that. Well, let's get back to the hotel. I don't want to be late getting over to see, though. No. Tired? Yes, I am. Well, there's no need for you to come to see, Dale. I can see Fiona Scott by myself. Yes, of course you can. But you're not going to. <laughs> Room 528, please. Uh, there you are, Mr. Temple. Thank you. Oh, and Mr. Temple, Mr. Kelburn left a message. He said, when you came in, would you care to join him in the American bar? Oh, thank you, Steve. Here's the keys. I'll be up in a few minutes. All right, dear. 
Over here, Temple. Oh, hello, Kelvin. I got your message. Uh, sit down. What are you drinking? Uh, I don't think I'll have anything at the moment, thank you. Well, have you reached a decision about that problem, Temple? Yes, I have. I will help you, Kelvin. Good. And I'll tell you why I'll help you. If your wife is friendly with someone, I think there's a chance that that person may be able to help me. Help you? With what? With my investigations. You see, I still intend to find out who murdered your daughter. All right, go ahead. But just at the moment, it's my wife I'm interested in. No one likes to be made a fool of, Temple. The moment you find out who Linda's playing around with... I'll let you know. Hi, Timothy, this is a lonely part of the country. We haven't passed a car for ages. I hope we're on the right road. I expect we'll see a signpost soon. By then it'll be too dark to read it. <laughs> Cheer up, Steve. <laughs> oh, look, th there's a cyclist. Mm, where? Oh, yes, yes, I see him. I think it's a parson. Oh, good evening. Good evening. We're looking for a place called Breakwater House. Ah, yes, yes, Breakwater House. Now, let me see... It's a little off the beaten track. Oh? Uh, you must keep a careful lookout for a turning on the left. Rather a narrow lane. I should say very nearly a mile. It's just past a large old-fashioned barn. You can't miss it. And Breakwater House is actually down the lane? Yes, about a quarter of a mile down the lane. There's rather a delightful arch at the entrance to the drive with a stone dolphin at the top. A dolphin? Yes, do look out for it. A beautiful piece of work. Uh, when you reach the drive, go carefully. It's rather twisty and the surface is very uneven. I'm much obliged. Oh, not at all. Not at all. I'm sure you won't have any trouble finding it. Good night. Good, Good night, night and thank you. Paul? Mm -hmm. You heard what he said Yes, about... I heard. Don't worry, I'll take care. We must be coming to the end of the lane. Yes, there's the gateway. Why, Timothy, it's a pretty formidable gate. It's wrought iron. Oh, looks new to me. <laughs> it's just as well it's open. We'd have had a job to open it ourselves. Yes. There's the arch the vicar mentioned. Yes, and there's the dolphin. Yes. Take it easy up the drive. A sharp bend, Paul. Why have you stopped? Look, there's a rope, oh. a steel rope, right across the drive. Why are those bricks hanging from it? They'd have smashed the windscreen to bits if we'd run into them at a good speed. Oh. Fortunately, I was crawling. The rope's fastened to a tree over there. And to the top of a fence on this side. Hold on. What are you doing? I'm, I'm trying to... Unfasten it. No, it, it's no use. Somebody's made quite a job of this. What are we going to do? Well, we can't take the car further down the drive because of the rope. I suppose we'd better go back to the hotel. Unless we walk up to the house. That's what you'd like to do, isn't it? Yes. But if you're worried, Steve... No, no, I'm all right. Let's take a look at the house. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. But give me your arm. You know, that fortune teller must have known that we were coming here. Mm, what's more important, she knew there'd be an attempt to stop us. You mean she knew about the rope? I don't know, but she certainly knew something was going to happen. Ah, there's the house. Yes. Mm, but it's so dark, Paul. There are no lights anywhere. Mm, perhaps there are some at the back of the house. Come on, let's take a look. place seems derelict. Yes. There's certainly no one living here. Oh, this French window's open. Ah, then let's go inside. Give me your hand. Well, the house seems to be empty. There's no furniture at all. No, not even a carpet. Oh, just look at the wallpaper. Huh. This isn't any better either. By Timothy... Just look at the place. Listen. 
came from upstairs. Mr. Stemple, I'm upstairs. Help! That sounds like Tony Wyman. Yes, it does. Mr. Stemple, help me. I'm upstairs. It is Tony Wyman. Let's go. Keep hold of my arm. Where do you think the voice was coming from? I don't know. Wyman! Tony, where are you? Oh, there are so many rooms up here. There, there must be a dozen or more. Yes. Let's have a look in here. Oh, well. He's obviously not here. No. Is that a dressing room over there, Steve, or... Paul! Somebody's closing the door! No. Blast! They've locked it. What a stupid fool. I ought to realise that somebody was watching us. Here! Here, open this door! Do you think it was Tony Wyman we heard, and he deliberately got us upstairs? Wait a minute, wait a minute. What is it? Do you smell petrol? Yes. Well, you're right. There's something burning. Someone started a fire, Steve. Oh, Paul! We have to get this door open! That was the fifth episode of the Francis Durbridge serial, Paul Temple and the Margot Mystery, with Peter Cook as Paul Temple and Marjorie Westbury as Steve. Production for the BBC was by Martin C. Webster. <laughs>